Tell me first off, how do you view the kind of geopolitical dynamics of this and where do you see the greater demand coming from? Are you being very watchful of the potential that China is going to limit the ability to access their supply of rare earths? Look, the, the supply of rare earths um, is based on two areas. One is the, the products that go into producing things like permanent magnets, like the neodymium, praseodymium, NDPR, as they call it. So that's one component. And China dominates the, the market. Nearly 90% of the market is controlled by China, where it converts those oxides into metals and metal powders that produce those permanent magnets. So globally, that's what drives the demand into the electrification you know, of electric vehicles, renewable energies and the like, and the new technologies. Where ASM is looking to, to leverage off one, its Stubbo project in New South Wales, but also it's this innovative technology that we've developed with Korea in Korea, where we can produce high purity metals, both the rare earths and other critical metals for new technologies. We see ours, us being able to provide a, an alternative to provide security and stability and sustainability with our focus initially in, into Korea. David, we also heard this morning Australia releasing their resources, technology and critical minerals processing roadmap. This is a 10 year uh, plan designed to boost a supply of crucial products in the manufacturing industry locally. What do you know about this plan and how beneficial do you think it will be to your business? Look, we've been talking with the critical minerals facilitation offices and, and the government for, for quite some time about the strategy on how to, to leverage off um, the resources that Australia has, as Heidi mentioned earlier, you know, Australia has significant uh, supply of these these rare earth elements. So we're encouraged by by that uh, that uh, focus that is a, that is being achieved in the government. But really, the key the key for ASM, and this is where ASM differentiates from most other uh, uh, producers in Australia, we'll be able to take those products and convert those into a metal. So as a part of our overall plan, plan, once we build our first metal plant in Korea, which will be up and running by mid 2022, we then have a template to take our metal plant and we'll be looking to put plants into Europe, a plant into Australia, so we can leverage off and become like a metal hub for Australia. Then we produced additional value products that can then drive into into the new technology markets, hopefully in manufacturing in Australia, which would be very encouraging, but also globally. So why didn't you start there? Why start in Korea? Uh, good question. We were fortunate. We've had a and worked for over five years, a great relationship with Korea through the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy here. They, they have two key departments, the Department of uh, the Korean Institute of Technology and the Korean Institute of Rare Metals. And they, through the Korean government, had a $2 billion uh, initiative to support the development of new technologies. We were introduced to a professor in, in Korea, and that professor had a unique view on how to metallize titanium and also rare earths. Uh, we invested 1.2 million US dollars in a laboratory and we were able to metallize all of our products from our on a Dubbo project uh, successfully. We then uh, decided to go to a commercial pilot plant. So going from the two and a half kilogram um, batch to mm. 25 kilo, and we were able to metallize that again. And we got four and a half million US dollars support. So the support we've got from Korea, uh, given that Korea's history with you know, the, the trade wars it's had with China, mm. Japan and globally, uh, Korea has just been a great place. And look, the, the support we've got here is, is, is just fantastic and been very successful. So, right, it seems that government support is key in you making decisions on where you go next. Uh, you mentioned plants perhaps in Europe and other regions. Are you seeing that type of support, that type of push? Because already here in the U.S., we are seeing that sort of initiative from the Biden administration. Where uh, could we see it next? Yeah, look, we're, we're very encouraged with what President Biden is, is saying and moving forward. And that, to me, is a great 
uh, a great initiative and we hope that uh, we can move forward with that. You know, I've had conversations with the, um, the Rare Earth Task Force uh, Committee out of the White House uh, in November last year. Um, as we have successfully produced metals and, and, and made public announcements on that success, more and more people are sending comments, look, can we talk to you about supply of titanium? Can we have uh, talk to you about supply of rare earths, you know, both the heavy and light rare earths we've done? So there's a momentum <coughs> building that people are wanting um, because they want that other alternative out of that 90% that's done in, um, uh, <coughs> pardon me, that's, that's done in China. And that's where ISM has a significant opportunity. David, the thing with rare earths that's interesting to me is that it's not actually rare, right? It's just that supply is kind of secured in certain pockets geographically. How do you view the investment cycle at the moment? Is there enough exploration going on? Is there too much going on? What's your view? Uh, look, there are, as you, as you point out, rare earths aren't necessarily rare, Heidi. There are, there are, they are quite, a, they're well endowed in, in, in the crust of, of the earth. Now, having an economic deposit, well, that's a different, uh, different proposal. So, you know, with, with what Australia has in its resources, it, it's been very fortunate to be endowed with some, some good, uh, good resources. So, you know, to take up a, if you look at say ASM and Dubbo, it's taken about 10, 15 years to get the deposit you know, secure and understand the metallurgy, produce a proven flow sheet, and then get into a market where we've seen significant volatility in prices. And you just go back to say 2010, 11, uh, where there was an initiative that got Linus through through Japan Inc. to, to move forward on. We're now another price volatility with lots of uh, comments about you know, restriction of supply and all, and all those sort of things going out. So prices have adjusted, you know, nearly a 60% increase in NDPR in the last 12 months. So you've got all this sort of stuff. I think, I think the work that's being done, uh, you've got ASM coming out with Dubbo. Dubbo is, um, mm. it's licensed, it's got its approvals. We're just optimizing the work we're doing now based on being able to produce metal. So we've got an integrated supply right. in our own business. Um, I, look, I think the work that's going on will continue, but um, I think your big projects have been defined right. clearly now.